What's up guys, it's Zach here, and I'm so glad you could join me for the final bit of this work. This is sort of the rounding off of the whole last session's bit of work. And this is to sketch cubic functions. So, let's see what we have to do to get that right, why don't we? So, the first part of this lesson, we'll just be going over what cubic functions are, how they'll look, and all of those sort of things. The next part, we'll look at how we're going to actually do that. And we'll have a little shopping list of things to do. There'll be four really easy items to go through. So, the first part of that will be the, sh the intercepts. The next part will be the turning points, and then finally the point of inflection. Once those three, well, the intercepts are actually two because it'll be an X and a Y, but once we've got all four of those factors in, then we can easily just sketch our cubic functions, and there we go. Those marks are in the bank. Okay, so let's start off with just a quick review of the cubic function. So, what will be given in the exam will be a standard cubic in the form of something like this. You know it's a cubic because the highest power of X will be the three. So, let's see what this normally would look like. It'd be something similar to what you see on the board now, with the Y intercept here at the bottom, the two, or sorry, it could be a number, it could be one, two, or three X intercepts, depending on how the function is moving around. So be aware of that. This could be a possible, possible catch function for you. So the three in this case will be one, two, and three. And then looking at the, the turning points, remember this is the shopping list we're going down. So we found our Y intercepts, we found our X intercepts, we found our turning points, and then the last part is finding the point of inflection. And I'll go through with all four of these with you guys now before I sketch anything further. Okay, so first things first, the intercepts. Let's start with the Y intercept. How you find that is very, actually, incredibly easy, at least in comparison with the other three. And all you do is you set your X value inside of your function to zero. So let's look at our example that we've been given and set that value to zero. And in this case, you can see that this our first three terms of x all go to zero. And that leaves us simply with a y-intercept of x minus six. Let's plot that inside of our overall function curve, or sorry, on our axes to see exactly where everything is. As you can see, it'll plot right down there at the bottom. Don't necessarily worry about the values. Just note, note where everything is and just look for irregularities. A y-intercept that's not on the y-axis is not a y-intercept, don't you agree? Okay, so let's go on to the next step. This may be a bit more challenging because of the fact that it's not so quick and it takes a bit of work that we did on earlier. So let's quickly go over it. What we need to do is factorize f of x or make sure that we are in a factorized form. And the way we do that is remember what we did earlier, that factor remainder theorem and synthetic division. But before we get to that, the simple premise of why we need to do that is that we need to get that function f of x equal to zero and then find its roots. Okay, let's look at our example and then move from there. And you might remember this from an earlier section where we looked at synthetic division and factor remainder theorem to get our functions into factor form. Remember, factor form is those brackets, one after the other, right? But let's quickly make sure we understand what we're doing and to get that value. So, looking at the example we have again, that f of x function as we had it here, this might look very familiar to what we were working with earlier, and it is. It's exactly what we were working with. So, the first thing we do is we set it to zero, but we can see there's no way we can factorize this, at least intuitively, to what we can do. So, the sneaky little remainder factor theorem here, plus synthetic division, provides us with the factors as we remember it there. If you don't remember this, do a few examples before you start really getting into this to make sure you're comfortable with that work. So, once you have that, you can easily see that your x-intercepts are at one, two, and three. Let's quickly see where that plots on our graph. And also, use this opportunity to make sure that you haven't made a mistake somewhere. So, as you can see, they plot one, two, and three. Isn't that satisfying? So, the things that you should look out for here is if all of a sudden you've got an x-intercept that's not on the x-axis, because that's a, an obvious giveaway. But the other things that could be very simple to throw off is if, for instance, your x-intercepts all of a sudden are on the wrong sides of each other in a way that you just can't in intuitively connect them. But remember, don't make too quick a decision. Just make sure you're aware of what you're looking for. So... The next thing we need to find on our shopping list was that turning point. And the turning point was defined as being the point where our gradient, our first derivative, huh, you might be smiling to yourself and thinking, but it wasn't that what we did in the first section. And it exactly is. So let's quickly go over what we did to do that. The f of x using the power rule is exactly what we need to find the derivative. So using our example as a template to just go through it again, look at that. The first derivative using the power rule, remember, you bring the three down and then you minus one. And that's the first one. That's your cubic sorted. You bring the two across and you derive the one down. See, very simple. 
Same thing with the 11. That 1 goes to 11 is still 11. That's our first derivative. Now look at the next section. The next section says you need to find the roots of f of x. So you set this function to 0. And remember, I told you about once you have the quadratic form, use anything you're comfortable with working with. The quadratic formula is the simplest, but not necessarily the most efficient. So look for what you work with best. Getting back to what we're working on here, that once we've derived, using the quadratic function gave me 2.577 and 1.422. This might seem a bit off, but I guess that's what we had to pay for, for having such nice x-intercepts and y-intercepts. But let's quickly plot them on, or rather, before we do that, I almost made the careless mistake of not checking where the y value is. How can you plot something without the y value? But we're not plotting it back in here. We're plotting it back in the original function. Remember that. So for x equals minus, sorry, x equals 2.6, I've just shortened it a bit to make it a bit easier to follow. That gives us a, a y value of minus 0.38. Then x equals 1.4 gives us 0.38. Where does that plot on our x-axis, on our axes in general? Well, I'm glad you've asked that because that if I had a look at it now, we have our x-intercepts, we have our y-intercepts. So the x, sorry, our turning points for 1.4 comes in just above the x-axis and just below. So what do we do next? Well, the last thing on our shopping list, if you remember correctly, is the point of inflection. The point of inflection is the point along our curve where our gradients start shifting from negative to positive. It's a very interesting point to look at when the mathematical studies, but for our sake, all we have to know is that you have to take the second derivative equal to zero, find the roots for the second derivative, and then substitute those roots back into your original function. So let's quickly see how the example would plan out for this. So using again, standard format, write it down for yourself if you want to, just to make sure you make no careless errors. Okay, first derivative as we had previously, using the power function, do it again. Just apply the derivative once and then do it again. It's really that simple. Then remember, we're trying to find the roots of this function simple thing is set it to zero. Once we have that, we can solve for x. And then once we've done that, we can find x is equal to two. But remember where to substitute that x equals two back in. That doesn't go back to any of the n but the original function on top. So as you can see, I've derived, I've plugged it in for you already. And that all reduces down to zero. <laughs> Convenient, isn't it? But that's what I'm saying by easy things to check is to see if it comes out as a really nice number. If it is, it's normally what they're looking for. So Let's quickly get a visual perspective of what we've just derived. So here's what we have so far. We have our y-intercept down here. We have our three x-intercepts along the curve. And then I have our new two turning points. But where does the point of inflection fit? Right there. So I've added this dotted line to sort of signify the one change of gradient to the other change of gradient. But don't worry too much about that. So we get on to the last part of this, the most fun. So we found our four y-intercepts, our x-intercepts, our turning points, and our point of inflection. The last thing for you to do now, after you've added all of this, and remember, you can take your time here to make sure that if you have x-intercepts here and your y-intercepts there and your turning points are here, it should all really already show you what your curve looks like. But let's draw it in here to see what it would look like. Just connect the dots as we go through our y-intercept, first x-intercept, through the turning point, hit the point of inflection. At this point, you should be seeing that all that's gonna happen here is it's just mirrored. And that might go all the way down there and then back up to infinity. And there we have it. Straight away, drawn the sketch. There's a few catches that they could catch you with. The one being that if you look at the curve, a cubic function can also look like that, where there's just one singular y-intercept and one singular x-intercept. And then one more example, just to be safe, is you might have a curve where there is no x-intercepts and no y, sorry, there's no x-intercepts. This is possible just so long as you keep in mind how these work. Oh, sorry, there'll be just a singular x-intercept with the others being lifted off the curve. Okay, so let's quickly review what we've done here. So the lesson to review, the first thing we do is draw your axes, because that's where you're gonna be working mostly. This is what we're trying to do, right? Your first thing, find your intercepts. Once you have those, you need to remember you can derive most of whatever else comes, but your first thing is your intercepts. So. The y-intercept you get by setting x equal to zero. The next, your x-intercept you find by setting y equal to zero. Remember, just the movement along the curve. And I'm just plotting them here. So there's your y-intercept, your x-intercepts, and then your turning point. The first derivative is set to zero. This is a very easy slip to make mistakes in, so check that value carefully. Once that comes in, you plot it in yourself. Then point of inflection, it's almost a step-by-step. -step. You can almost do these as a sort of one plus one, and then you have your final value. There, you set that to zero, and that gives you your, your point of inflection, and then connect the dots. And there we have it. 
our cu cubic function is done. Thank you so much for following me through these last three sessions. Guys, good luck with your cubic sketching, and I'll see you next time.